Okay, uh, welcome, welcome back everybody uh, from, uh, from the coffee break. Uh, I hope you managed to uh, battle the queue for a um, We're about to get underway now with the, the, the next section of the, uh, the event. Uh, we've got five different vendors up um, to explain obviously the technologies that are being used uh, to deliver the networks to the operators are busy um, deploying. We're start, starting off uh, this session with um, Steve Collins. He's the CTO of uh, Netcom Wireless. Um, Steve has spent his career um, specializing in many technologies, end to end IoT, 3G, 4G, and no doubt he's also got his eye on, on the hype around 5G as well and what we uh, expect and want from, from that. Um, so I'll let Steve um, kick things off um, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with some questions um, following Steve's presentation. Thanks very much. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. The title of my talk today is called Superfast Broadband for All. It's a fairly vanilla sounding title. But uh, actually if you pull apart the title a little bit, it gets a little bit complicated. I think the most important part of the title is actually the last two words. For all. Broadband for everyone. And we've actually heard a number of uh, speakers this morning all talk about this concept of trying to get the service of broadband connection through to everybody within a footprint, all premises, all people. It's actually a complicated thing to do. And a lot of operators start off with a certain way of doing things. They want to uh, do fibre to the premise for every, every house within a footprint, but then it gets complicated, it gets hard to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. As well as that concept of broadband for all, what sort of broadband are we delivering? What's the level that makes people happy? What is the speed by which uh, customers are content? And that's this term I've got at the front, which is super fast broadband, because it seems that every year the speed level that people want is just a bit faster than the previous year. Twice as fast as last year, thanks, we'll have that. So what is this super fast broadband I'm speaking of? I looked up super fast in the dictionary and I got a very helpful response. Super fast equals extremely fast. <laughs> it's great, thank you very much Oxford Dictionary. <coughs> so it doesn't mean anything, this whole term of very fast, super fast, it just keeps changing and it just means faster than last year. So it doesn't matter what the speed is. People like Netflix have been spoken about a lot today because it's a bit of a disruptor that have come in. They've come in with new speeds or new ways of doing things and there's this content demand, a lot of download content demand that's coming. So they put their own rules around what is an adequate broadband connection. And uh, this information you see here is how they try to categorise it. They've said, okay, well, you need a couple of megabits per second broadband to do your normal internet, and then you need three meg for standard def, five meg for HD, and then you might need 25 meg for a 4K TV stream. Okay, that's interesting. There's not that much 4K content out there, but there's a bit. If you had a number of screens in your house, then 50 meg, that's pretty good. In downlink, 100 meg, that's heaps. But it still doesn't tell you everything that consumers need, and it's still very downlink centric. It suits Netflix, but it doesn't suit every consumer. So the right response of what is the super fast broadband, the broadband that consumers want, the answer is it's the service that the consumer signed up for. That's what they should get. And they shouldn't get the marketing hype of, well, hey, uh, we now are launching this new gigabit service. We can do a thousand megabits per second. Well, you can when it's three o'clock in the morning and when no one else is using the service, but during the peak hour, or maybe it's something like 20 or 30. No, you should get the service you signed up for 24 seven. Now let me talk about this idea of service because I think that's the way that the world is going. The world is moving away from this internet broadband connectivity that is a luxury or something that you sign up for and it does what it does when you need it. It's now the thing that has to be on all the time. And I liken that to the other services or the other utilities that you get into your household. 
water, sewerage, gas, power. These are services that should just work all the time. And they've kind of taken for granted when they work. When you have electricity and you turn your switch on and the light comes on, there's no party to be had. No one does a round of applause and says, hooray, the light came on. That's not how it works. But if you turn the switch on and the light does not come on, well now, doom and gloom. You get on the phone, you ring your service provider. My electricity is not working. That's a major problem. And that's the sign of a utility when you look at it in that, that light. And broadband is becoming that service. If it works, great, everyone's happy. But if it doesn't work, even for five seconds, if you're watching Netflix and the buffering circle comes up for five seconds, that's when you have a problem. So it's this minimum performance, the minimum grade of broadband connectivity that you ask for, that's actually what matters. That's what consumers are looking for. And when something becomes a service, like electricity, gas, sewage, then regulators and governments start getting involved. They start looking at the minimum grade of service and they start putting rules in place to say, this is the minimum performance you, operator, must deliver to the end users, my constituents within this political area. NBN has actually been facing that and dealing with that since its inception. NBN as an operator has actually had to deal with this regulator-led attitude to the service they're delivering ever since 2009. And a lot of operators around the world are now looking at NBN and saying, oh, how have you, how have you coped with that? How have you dealt with these pressures of delivering a minimum service as opposed to just the marketing headline of an up to speed or the latest technology wave that comes through? We've heard from a few other operators here this morning uh, doing the same thing. They're now starting to look at how they deliver a service to everyone with different uh, grades of service. And in EU, they've got these rural minimum performances, then urban minimum performance. Not peak speeds, but minimum performance. And as a technology vendor, which Netcom is, we spend our life going and talking to operators about how we can help them deliver these minimum performance level uh, services to their entire footprint. Okay, so what's missing? What am I saying is going wrong? Because uh, for many years we've all been on this technology wave. Every year or two the new technology comes out and everyone jumps on it and says that's the new thing, that's the new thing that we want, that's what we need to roll out across our country and then two years later there's a new one. And we've only ever addressed that easy or the low hanging fruit part of our network. So what's missing to do this service across the whole country or the whole geographical area? So firstly, it's changing the attitude towards the peak speed to a minimum service level speed. That's key. So super fast services promised. Looking at all the unknowns in the network, your network topology where you have, for example, if it's a wireless part of it, there might be that wireless link from base station through to house. That's an unknown part of the network. Or if it's using copper, it's the copper from the exchange through to the home or the node through to the home. They're unknown, they're unmanaged. How do you address those unknown part of your networks and take control of it? That's usually using some modern technology to either get the fibre closer to the home or put units, wireless units, on the outside of the home using professional installation so that you have a known wireless link from house through the base station. These are ways of taking control of those unknown or unmanaged parts of your network. <coughs> The CP, the customer's premises equipment, the device that delivers the service into the home, they've become a commodity. Cost has driven them down. Uh, but what's happened when uh, that's occurred is that they've got simpler, they've got less intelligent, and they do less for the operator. And one thing operators can do is they can put intelligence into their CPE to do things that only they manage or only they control. It's a way of differentiating their service through the end users. One of the common themes I think we've heard this morning from Korea Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, and NBN, is they've talked about these creative ways in which they've solved the connectivity problem in their geographical footprint. No one had the same solution. Everyone had unique ways of delivering the service through to the end user. That's implying an engineered solution rather than off the shelf, here's the thing, take it, sell it. That works for a large percentage of the network, but not for the whole thing. So this idea of one size fitting all, it does not, one size does not fit all. And each operator with their own unique sets of challenges, it might be a high rise building, it might be a pit, uh, different constraints all over the world, 
each operator's finding that one size does not fit all. And they have to partner really closely with their vendor and technology uh, ecosystem to work out a way to solve all that, which is really where Netcom's playing. So, the idea is don't do fiber for everywhere. Fiber makes a lot of sense, but you've got a whole suite of infrastructure technology types you can choose from. Wireless, fiber, copper, HFC, satellite, they're the five big ones. Satellites, basically your pinch hitter where you can't do anything else. The others are useful, they can all, they're all evolving, they've all got new technology waves coming. At Netcom, we're playing mainly in the first three, wireless and fiber and copper for fiber to the distribution point. I want to talk a little bit about fiber. We've heard about it from all the speakers this morning around how fiber to everyone has proven to be quite hard. Um, I'm going to quickly dive off into economics for a second. The law of diminishing returns. This is an economic principle by which if you're trying to optimize a system or op optimize a process, if you have a constrained set of variables and you only vary one, you can keep throwing money or keep throwing time at one and eventually you get to the point where it's at its most efficient and you get a diminishing return from that point. And this curve you see here is my attempt to show that. And if you think about rolling out fiber across an entire geographical area, this is kind of the curve you get. You start off, it's relatively straightforward. You're not very good at it to start with. Uh, the vertical axis is how efficient you are at doing it. The horizontal axis is you scrolling all the way to 100% coverage. So you start off, you go up, it's all going very well. You're getting better and better, it's becoming more efficient. But eventually you get to the point where you've addressed the majority of the area that's easy to get to, and now it's starting to get hard. And very rapidly, you start to enter the period of negative returns, where it's so hard to get a fibre into everyone's home that it's just too costly or too, it takes too long to make that connection work. And that's where you want to stop. You want to stop before it becomes inefficient. So notionally, what I've got here is an 80-20 split. Now don't take the numbers as gospel. This is just to kind of put it in easy terms. Everyone talks about an 80-20 split. 80% 80 for the majority, 20% for everything else. And I think that makes a lot of sense when we talk about technology. If you can cover 80% of your footprint with fibre to the home, good job. In USA, actually, a lot of HFC as well for that predominant technology. But for the rest of the world, it does seem to be fiber. And, the, and then 20% other. And I've got a few candidates up here, fiber to the distribution point, fiber to the curb, uh, fiber to the cabinet, fixed wireless. They're the ones that Netcom uh, have products in. And then you have the other technologies like HFC and satellite that can come in and help. But it's not like saying, here's your fiber to the DP product, go solve your remaining 20%. Because every geographical area has their own challenges around how they could uh, deploy that technology. So enough of my sermon on uh, what technology and why not fibre everywhere. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about the technology types that Netcom specialise in to give you a bit of a view on where I think uh, the technology is going. So, uh, fibre to the distribution point. Here's a picture of a unit that's, um, well, it's a black box. It's not so exciting, but there's a lot of engineering that's gone into this black box uh, to have a GFAST 212 uh, profile unit that splits fibre into copper pairs that can then run into a home. This one looks the way it looks because it happens to spend its life living in a pit uh, that can be underwater uh, and just spend its life there for the next eight, 18 years. It's converting fibre into copper and some operators around the world consider this product fibre to the home because where does it live? It lives out the front of your driveway, it lives in the pit at the front of your house or it might live in a basement of a building that's as fibre to the home as you can get without digging up the driveway. It's as close as you can. There's some operators who have copper going all the way into the home, but that copper is in an armoured cable and it's buried in dirt under the driveway. It was put there 30 years ago. The copper still works, and over short distances, you can run 1.5 gigabits per second aggregate out of that using 212 meg GFAST. But you can't get to it. You can't pull it out of the ground and put a fibre in without doing major civil works. So this sort of product is a great other technology that's still almost fiber to the home, but they call it fiber to the DP. So Netcom uh, did a demonstration at OpenReach at their technology center earlier this year, which uh, was the first reverse power 212 pro profile DPU that there was in the world. Reverse power means that the power is supplied from the premises as opposed to a, a power plant nearby. So that's a technology that Netcom's investing a lot of money in. Uh, 
got a number of different port counts and different physical locations where they go. And we think that's a really good uh, technology for anyone who needs a, a gigabit plus. And you've still got fiber going almost all the way to the home, but not incurring that uh, major cost and time. The other technology we're spending a lot of time on and dollars on is wireless. Uh, we have a product that we launched at NBN uh, with Ericsson for 4G Advanced, uh, LTE Advanced. And in the uh, light blue, they had these services, 12 meg down, 1 meg up in 2013, 25 down, 5 up in 2014, uh, 50 down, 20 up in 2015. And next year, uh, they're launching 100 meg down, 40 meg up. This is a highly engineered product. It's not just a mobile phone that sits on your shelf and has an antenna on it. No, this is a device that is installed on the outside of a home with uh, high gain antennas. It's professionally installed and it's aligned through to a base station. And this is take control of that unknown part of the network I referred to earlier in the talk. By having it professionally installed and aligned, the operator can leave the site knowing that that device is performing at a certain physical rate and they can leave knowing that that's the rate it will perform at, at, at a minimum minimum service is now guaranteed. So you can do that today. Uh, you can, that technology, there's 100 meg down, 40 meg up, you can demonstrate that at one gigabit per second, provided you've got all the network resources assigned to you. But as a service for multiple users, 100 down, 40 up is about right. You can probably get double that using uh, four carriers, four carriers of 20 megahertz. That's doable now. LTE Pro gives you five or six carriers, you can, you can double that speed or so. You can't get an order of magnitude faster, you can't get to a gigabit. So how do you get to a gigabit? Well the answer is 5G. 5G is not performing any magic science, it's just widening those carriers for the broadband use case anyway. I talked about 20 megahertz channel carriers for 4G, you aggregate that, four or five, now you've got 100 megahertz of carrier space. And that's how much data you can throw through. 5G, we're talking about a, a giga, one gigahertz of carrier space. With an order of magnitude amount more of spectrum, and you get an order of magnitude amount of throughput improvement. But that sort of spectrum is not around at the frequencies that we would like to use, the ones that propagate well, the ones that will go through windows and through doors and the like. So where do they find that spectrum? They find it up in millimeter wave, and millimeter wave is hard to use. It's complicated. Uh, we heard from uh, Bruno Deutsch Telekom uh, talk about how there's a lot of science still to go on using the millimeter wave, and he's right. But there's a lot of activity too. So there are three use cases for 5G that 3GPP are working on, broadband, mission critical, and massive machine type. I want to just touch on them a little bit, then I'll bring it together for you at the end. So enhanced mobile broadband, that's the one that here at a broadband conference we're probably all very interested in. <coughs> Some of the key features that uh, EMBB brings from 3GPP is the ability to have more devices onto an ENOB or a GNOB as it will be called in uh, 5G. Uh, that's interesting if you're an operator because you can now have more load on the same cell. Doesn't necessarily mean that every user gets more performance. You can just have more users because of massive MIMO. You've got more focused beams coming from, from the base station. You can now have more conversations going on at once with the same network resource. Uh, now, the extrapolation of that is when you're not in a real peak period, you can actually get a lot better performance, but it's not always guaranteed. But that peak load can be handled better. But because millimeter wave has a, a poorer propagation characteristic than the current frequencies we use, uh, the cells are smaller. They have to be. That's the uh, penalty you pay by going up in frequency. So, uh, because the cells are smaller, Everyone's trying to work out what do you do with these tiny cells? How do you make it work for the enhanced mobile broadband and use case? Well, a few things have been flying around, public places, sporting venues, train stations, the like, they make sense. Uh, line of sight is the one that Netcom's investing a lot of money into. This is where you have a, a base station and a connection through to homes. Maybe it's rooftop, maybe it's eve. Uh, trying to get out of the clutter of uh, trees and buildings that line of sight connection is one that uh, Verizon's been making a lot of noise out as well. There's still a lot of work to go on to make that uh, work in a cost effective way. But it is the one that, this is the use case that everyone's making the most noise about today. But it's not the only use case. And the really important thing about uh, the talk today is to have to think about uh, what else is out there. Another use case is mission critical. This is not about fast broadband or 
or wide channel bandwidths. This is about latency. This is about guaranteed quality connections through to the end user. It might be machine control, it might be vehicle to vehicle communications, it might be a factory with a high precision machine that's being controlled by somewhere else in the world. That's mission critical. That's a very different use case for the network. It's a very different use case for the device as well. I'll come back to that point next. Uh, the other use case 3GPP is talking about is massive machine. And this is uh, IoT, if you like, Internet of Things. Uh, this is an evolution of narrowband IoT. And this use case, again, is very different. It'll be uh, striving towards maximizing the coverage so that you can get penetration deep into basements or deep into uh, country areas. And it will be extremely cost driven because everyone's talking about this use case as being uh, lots, billions and billions of units. So this device, uh, this use case, the devices have to be super, super cheap. So, take a little step back. 5G is coming. There's a huge amount of money being invested into it. Even at Netcom, we're investing a huge amount of money into the uh, EMBB broadband use case. So will it come? Yes. Will it come in and ride over the top of all the other existing technologies? I, I say no. And why? Let's take a little step back. 2G, when it started, was a voice network. And some bright sparks worked out how to overlay a packet data core on top of that voice network. So we had GPRS come in, and we had a data service in parallel with a voice service. That theme continued into 3G. We had a voice service network. We had a, a better evolved packet core for 3G, but they were side-by-side -side networks. At 4G, they threw all that out the window, and they collapsed it all down into a data network. 4G is a data connection, primarily and only. Voice is an over-the-top service. Voice over LTE is a packet service over the top using that data connection. There's things they've put in place to make that work, quality of service and the like, but it is a data connection. <clears throat> and a lot of the successes of 4G has been because of that simplification. They've really got that right. But it started to change. In recent years, they've been talking about, for those who are following it, Category 1, Category M, narrowband IoT. These are evolutions of 4G. And the use case for that is so, so different to the use cases where we're going up the speed curve. So it's fragmenting. The devices that are used on NBIoT are very different to the devices that you use in the broadband <coughs> part of, of 4G. And the network architecture is different as well. So this fragmentation into different use cases has already started. And, and as we go into 5G, we'll see this continue. NBIoT will go into massive machine type. Mission critical will form one on its own. Super fast broadband on its own. And I reckon there'll be some others as well. And if I knew what they are, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. I'd be off doing it. Why am I telling you this? Because 5G is coming, but no one's quite sure how it will realize. It'll be all of these things. The network architecture to support these use cases will have to be built. And if one network can do these use cases, they use these technologies, you might hear them being talked about NFV, network function virtualization, or network slicing. They'll take one network and they'll configure it a number of different ways for each of these different use cases. You configure it for latency, or configure it for performance for broadband. But that will take a lot of effort and a lot of cost for the operators to do so. Then think about the devices that have to sit on the edge of the network to support these use cases. Some will be super low power for a massive machine. Super cheap. Some will be all about latency, and they'll be designed to be embedded into a machine. And some will be for broadband. Meanwhile, operators have to work out how to bring all these products to market. How do you realize all these? How do you approve all these? That's going to get complicated. <clears throat> so there's a lot to come. It's very exciting, but it'll be lots of niches. And it's kind of like what's happening today with our broadband already. You've got fiber for 80%, but then you've got these fiber to the curb, or uh, wireless that are coming and filling in these niches. And so all these niches are going to open up in 5G for device vendors, network operators, and infrastructure vendors alike. So, two messages I'd like uh, to take away. If I could make it go on. I cannot. So I've got a flashing light on here. Very good, thank you. So, build for tomorrow. Two messages. One, broadband as a service is an entitlement for everyone within a geographical area. And that minimum performance level, that minimum speed, 
is what's being regulated and being attended to by all, all the operators. Some operators get it and are moving already. NBN had to do it because they've been doing it for years. Other operators are already going, and some are standing back and looking and saying, oh, I'm not sure about this minimum speed, but it's coming. So based on that idea of having a minimum performance for everyone within a geographical area, how do we do it? Well, the answer is deep engineering partnerships from operator through to infrastructure vendors through to device vendors. Deep engineering partnerships, looking at the problems in your geographical area, your pits, your conduits, your uh, houses, and how you solve all those connectivity problems for the last 20%. So that's what Netcom's doing. I thank you all for your time. Great, thank you, uh, Steve. Um, we're going to probably go straight into the next session, but we'll have uh, time for a few questions.